Good night. This is our last episode in the series of conversations between the artists exhibiting work with NLS and ARC magazine at Emerge Art Fair in Washington, D.C. next week. I'm Deborah Anzinger, and tonight I moderate a conversation between Onika Russell, Mark King, and Annabel Vasquez Rodriguez. Welcome to IN. We present IN monthly from New Local Space, and we're broadcasted from Audio Production House Creative Sounds in Kingston, Jamaica. NLS's 2014 programming is made possible with support from Creative Sounds Limited, Transformer Washington, D.C., and Alice Yard, a contemporary art space and network based in Port of Spain, Trinidad, and Tobago. A little bit about our guests before we get into the conversation. Mark King has a Master's of Fine Arts degree in Photography from the Academy of Art University in San Francisco. In 2011, the Lucy Foundation selected Mark for their apprenticeship program. In the same year, he participated in a residency at the Franz Messerial Centrum in Belgium. In 2012, he took part in an artist residency at Alice Yard in Trinidad. In 2013, he participated in two residences, Fresh Milk in Barbados and Atelier 89 in Aruba for the Mondrian Foundation's Caribbean Link 2. Hi, Mark. And welcome. Hi, hey, everybody. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Annabelle Vasquez Rodriguez is both an artist and independent curator. Her work explores socio political issues from an autobiographical perspective and has been exhibited nationally and internationally. Vasquez Rodriguez studied painting at the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras, and photography and film at the Massachusetts College of Art and Design. Anika Russell lives and works in Kingston, Jamaica. She studied painting, media, film, and video art in Jamaica, Japan, and the UK. She also lectures in fine art in the fine art department at the Edna, Mal Edna Manley College of the Visual and Performing Arts in Kingston. She was a 2007 awardee of the Commonwealth Arts and Crafts Award and visiting artist at the Pratt Munson Williams Proctor College in. In Utica, New York, she has exhibited in solo and group exhibitions in Singapore, the U.S., U.K., Japan, Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, Martinique, and Canada. Hi, Onika. Hi, Annabelle. Hi, Mark. Hola. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Let's, you. let's jump right into it. You all have the use of photography in your work in common with each other. Do you each consider this to be your primary medium? Was it always? And how is photography important to the kind of themes that you're interested in right now and the work that you're making? Onika, can we start with you? You overly painting on digital portraiture, um, digital portrait photography, and then you digitally print the final product as, as digital paintings is what you call them, I believe. Can you speak about the importance of photography and whether it's your primary medium? Uh, yes. Uh, photography for me um, start, it's like a starting point um, so a lot of the, the portraits that I made especially the ones that will be shown um, at Emerge and in other places um, recently it's really I take what I call a bad photograph so it's really not about um, taking a beautiful image it's just something that kind of records the way I look and then that provides like a basis for me to react to. Um, so I paint um, the digital paintings using my iPad. It's very immediate. Um, so yeah, photography really is a jumping off point for if I'm going to do a video or um, make these digital images or whatever else. Mm -hmm. How about how about you, Mark and Ada? Yeah, I feel that for me, photography is a huge part of the process. Even when I'm not producing a final product that is a photograph, and it's inherently representational, and those are the themes I'm kind of dealing with right now. So it's always there, and it's always a part of the process. And there's certain elements that I'm really pulling from within photography and my other work. Great, and Annabelle. Um, I guess yeah, it's it's photography as well is pivotal for for my work. Um, although I started started more as a painter, it's kind of been integrated um, 
into that and then later become became um, a main source of um, inspiration and kind of lead, leading the projects for me. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question I want to ask right off the bat from Holly Bainu, um, who's co-curating the presentation, um, the NLS and ARC presentation at Emerge. Your practice, um, this is for Mark, your practice has shifted drastically from conceptual photographic tradition into a more freestyle process of sketching, drawing, and working with abstraction. The new maps, installations, and patterns highlight a kind of cognitive approach to art making that is spontaneous, labored, and associative. What has this process allowed for you, Mark? Well, it's really just allowed me to follow my curiosity in a way that <laughs> photography did, but it wasn't as free, as free form at least, especially with the associations. And it allowed me to make more mistakes. So it's really picking around, trying out new things, and pulling in research. It's, I feel it's become a lot more conceptual thanks to that freedom from the camera. But I'm still using the camera in my process. But yeah. spending most of my time away from the camera. Yeah, I mean, the call and response, um, the call and response series, which is we're showing some of that work at Emerge, that is really a combination of um, of photography, uh, street interventions and um, yeah and, 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 and painting I guess because really and performance because the call and response I mean you, you see something the way it is um, in your environment is what you've done for example the, um, the Jesus is coming and then you you add to it what somebody else has already done and then Photograph it, and then the photograph is the final product. Um, the documentation of that act is the final product. I think. Um, I, I just could you speak a little bit more about that project and you know how you see the process of the project lending to the the concept of the project, the technical process and the concept. Okay. Uh, with with respect to that project. I look at it really as a moment where I started to shift away a little bit, shift from the work I was doing earlier, which was very portrait-centric and documentary in some spots. And I was really interested, overall really interested in locality. And what struck me, especially with the, with the culture shock of moving back to Barbados and the various culture shocks I've experienced from jumping around all my life. It was something that just kept jumping out at the, in the environment, jumping out at me, and I felt like I kind of had to intervene, especially with respect to where those signs are located and the context that they are located there in, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I think of Annabelle's work also when you mentioned that because uh, especially the Sombre series, Annabelle, where you, um, you, those are all so documentations of, of changes, mind you, transient changes in the environment that you've caused. And it's, I don't think it's a coincidence that it seems to be inspired from a similar place that Mark's work is from. Can you tell the audience, just give us a little bit of background on that series, Sombre, and just your work in general? Sure. Um, well, Sombras is a series that um, started back in March 2014, but it fits within um, a project and, and theme that I've been working since about 2002, um, which is exploring my in-betweenness from living abroad in, in New England from Puerto Rico, where I'm from. Um, and Sombra specifically started emerging from, from being back and producing and shooting uh, in Puerto Rico and thinking about my, myself, but also this idea of, of the return of, you know, of, of placing myself um, physically, but also the idea of sombras, shadows, um, of feeling like a shadow, almost um, uh, having been away, been, a, been living away for for over a decade and a half. So. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And um and Onika, you you can you give us your your photographs are also manipulated. Um, they start off with a portrait. Is the is the who is the subject? What is the subject of the portrait that you have manipulated? Yes. Um, so subject myself. Mm -hmm. Um. Because I, you know, I was living uh, abroad, and I think for first time I had to think about um, how people really perceive me. Um, because you know, I was living in Asia, and it's um, you're so completely foreign. And um, so for the first time, I, I tried to make myself the subject because that I felt like that was where um, work was leading. And um, yeah, so it's really um, I'm seeing the photography as a way of sometimes recording kind of some performance element that I um, do privately in my um, studio. So um, yeah, then I become the subject. And is there? I know. I mean, is it is it intuitive the way that you? You, um, the way that you merge painting or digital painting with photography. What's your What's your process like? Is it Is it intuitive or would you, Is it conceptually based um, on these kinds of issues that you're that you've brought up? Yeah, um, I would say it's a, a bit of both because um, so once I have the photograph of myself, which is not always a pleasant thing, you know, to look at, and then. I have to like respond to it, so that in that aspect is intuitive. You know, so I'm just like making marks on the surface. Um, but in essence, I think the whole um, the whole action is somehow a conceptual um, path. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And do, is it, are you of the are you of the thought that or the opinion that it's that the Concept and the process are um, will will be connected in inevitably, or do you, do you consider formal issues to be altogether different from um, conceptual issues? Both of you, I mean, all of you, actually, all three of you. This is a question I like to ask artists if they think form and content are. Um, uh, form and content are inextricably linked or, or not in their work. Yeah, that's, um, that's really very interesting, you know, um, for, you know, students that I teach, like, you know, you normally speak with them about form and content, and um, I think that's normally an encouraged starting point for artists. Um, but I think at a certain point, once the work starts to kind of take its own voice and evolve, then you kind of have to give it um, some, loosen the reins of it and allow it to go on its own direction, I feel, um, mm -hmm. this is a kind of intuitive path. Because I think you kind of have to trust at some point that um, all, all the work that you were doing before, thinking and um, Laboring over this um, idea is somehow becoming innate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And um, what do you guys, what do you, Mark, think about that? I mean, for me, they're pretty closely tied at the moment, especially since I'm really preoccupied by grids and the systems that use grids. Mm -hmm. So the form and the concept are, are very close right now. What what can you tell us a bit more about the grids? And also, um, after Mark is finished, if you if you guys could each just say out loud the URL where people can go and see more of your work, that would be great. But Mark, can you tell us first a little bit about the grids? Yeah, and what, where where do they or where does the actual where does the form originate? Like, what's the subject of the grid? What are you what, what, what exactly? Where does it come from? It comes from many different places for me, especially with pattern building. Patterns are pretty much based off of grid, based on grids, and mm -hmm. grids come into play when you look at 
cartography, map making, when you look at how cities are put together, even with photography, all the grid, and when you're frame your subject or your yeah, you, when you frame your subjects, you're framing them within a rectangle or a square, and the composition breaks down to a grid. Um, so that's how I really approach my process. It's very grid-based. It's very. Um, it could be free and restrictive. I can choose how restrictive or how free I want it to be within that grid system that I apply. Um, is there what is there a is there a concept behind this? I mean, are you mapping something? You brought up cartography, um, and you say form and content are linked for you. Is there a concept behind the grid? What are you mapping? Anything? Yeah, the concept is really I'm preoccupied with locality, moving around a lot, jumping from the Caribbean at a young age, going over to Europe and coming back to the States and jumping back to the Caribbean. It's always been that bouncing around and trying to trying to get my bearings and mm -hmm. really being interested in my space, not from a point of view of, okay, this is my space and this is what it's associated with. It's really been, okay, this is my space and that's what I see over there and this is how I'm experiencing it and this is how I perceive seeing other people experience where I am. Or where I've where I've been. Mm -hmm. But the work is very abstract, though. So, um, and what's this? What's the source content for the for the for the grids? You say you you source them from many. You have many sources for them. Are they yeah. actually based in 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 actual places and spaces that you? Is that what you the repeating elements? Where are the repeating elements originating from? Yeah, they're coming from the environment, so they're coming from objects within the environment and spaces, and the spaces in between the objects and the environments, and objects in relation to other objects. And it's quite architectural as well. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder, I want to tell the audience right now, by the way, that they can send in questions to us via Twitter. Um, our handle is NLS Kingston. Uh, that stands for New Local Space. So NLS Kingston. That's our Twitter handle. And then also you can send us a private message um, via Facebook if you are so inclined. I have another question. Um, I have another question from 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 Holly um, for. For Annabelle, and um, let me see if I can find it. Let's see here. Oh yes, there is an Annabelle. There is an available sense of displacement and tension in your work. I actually think that this is this is true of all of your work. Um, a sense of displacement and tension, um, which often ends up revealing a story of the anti-trap. And the antitropics given given the critical gaze and your method of constructing open and complex narrative. Um, it is often reminiscent of the work of Maya Deren and ethnographic films emerging out of the fifties and seventies. Can you speak a little bit about the language utilized in your video works? Oh yeah, I love this question. Thank you, Holly. <laughs> um, well, I'm glad that she mentioned Maya Deren because she's definitely an artist that I've looked up to and admired since um, my time at Mass Art, where I learned about her from my professors at the time, Mark Lepore and Saul Levine, um, and how how film can actually create the psychological space that I wasn't able to to do in photography, um, which is what attracted me the most, um, and also specifically using Super 8, like having that film, um, just the media, um, moving media, but that I could also handle and, and touch and, and cut up. Um, so in the, in the films, I usually love mixing black and white and color, because I feel they can 
create these kind of dreamlike spaces, this idea of dreaming in, in color and also in black and white. Um, and then going back to the super break, this, this nostalgia look, really, you know, inherent of, of that. But um, in terms of content, um, I'm interested in, like, mass media, um, looking at that, but also mixing that with, like, mundane stuff, um, or even documenting my family visits performance from the camera, um, of myself doing performance for the camera, um, and then thinking about also like protests that I go to in documents, um, and all of that kind of creating a, a non-linear um, experience of what it is to be in between two places. Um, right. uh, Annabelle, mm -hmm. but speaking of in between two places, in your video works where there's transportation involved, plane or train. I really feel that here versus there tension. And I just wanted to hear from you what impression this movement between and within Puerto Rico and the continental US uh, has left on your practice. Like, what is that like for you as an art practitioner? Um, well, I think I always like to think about um, what's personal is political. So, uh, using my my autobiographical experience of being in these two places um, has really made uh, a whole body of work um, and just presenting that in a way that maybe people can relate to, not necessarily if you're from Puerto Rico or in between New England and Puerto Rico, but that um, being diaspora or having that sense of displacement or just being um, yeah I don't know just in that in that state of otherness and mm -hmm. can create um, so many different levels of, of personalities and I think about who I was before, you know, 16 years ago, being a resident of Puerto Rico and the person that I've become now, kind of combining both of, of, of both these cultures that now I've kind of mixed and, and still having um, a very strong feeling of, of who I am and where I come from. Um, does that differ from your contemporaries in Puerto Rico? And how does your nostalgia kind of contrast with I guess the government's line, what mass media in Puerto Rico is putting out there. Because when I when I look at your work as a curator, especially when it comes to like video art, it feels as if that's such a powerful tool. Video and photography is a power, powerful tool to kind of rewrite the identity for a certain group, especially young people. But how does that how does that, uh, I guess, influence your desire to promote video art? How does your nostalgia, your personal nostalgia, and the differing, I'm assuming, nostalgia of popular culture in Puerto Rico mash up with those creating that work? Um, I don't think there was two parts to the question, right? Um. <laughs> I think there are at least eight. I jumped around a bit. Um. <laughs> well, um, I think the first part was like, how does it? How do I see it in my contemporaries in Puerto Rico, um, specifically video work, and um, then that connected to mass media representation of nostalgia. Um, bueno, pues, I think Puerto Rico be having this like uh, immediate highway with the U.S. has a lot of um, artists that are in the same position as I am. Um, so there is a lot of dialogue between other contemporary artists who are exploring um, living in two places at the same time or you know, um, having to, to kind of rip from not only mass media but also their personal experience, experiences. Um, I don't know, did that answer the question? <laughs> well, this is my last bit of that question that I'll uh, bring it up again. I just wanted to find out with respect to nostalgia and living in Barbados, for example, it's just 
you hear about the good old days and just this identity of what being a Barbadian is from just the news and the radio and popular culture here. And it's just quite narrow. And I was wondering, because you deal with colonialism and the colonial past of Puerto Rico as well, like how is that projected in Puerto Rico, this nostalgia, this collective nostalgia versus your nostalgia? Um, or is it shared? Or is it shared? Yeah, I mean, I, I think in, in different levels, um, like when I think of artists who are painting these, especially, I guess, painters painting this very nostalgic kind of countryside, beautiful landscapes of Puerto Rico, which you can still see, but um, the actual way of, of living um, at the time is, is kind of cherished, and um, also with their music, with country music, Hibaro music, um, it's still preserved, and at the same time, I feel there's also a lot of, kind of like how Holly stated, anti-tropic nostalgia. Um, and my nostalgia is specifically of, of the Puerto Rico I knew, um, not so much you know, going back to the 40s or 30s, um, or even you know, before. So to me, it's more of a general autobiographical feeling of who was I in 1995, and um, missing being that person, but also embracing the nostalgia as it making me the person I am today. Um, okay. But I do see a lot of nostalgia in a lot of uh, folk painters um, uh, who depict these like amazing like flamboyant landscapes. Um, the person, you know, cutting the sugar cane, like it's really nice. But um, I have history from my family, and um, my grandfather was a sugar cane cutter, and my mom tells me all the time how it was, um, it was horrible. <laughs> it was like really um, not something to to be like yearning about. You know, she said it was really, really tough, and for for the family, for him. Um, so, my person, I look at my personal experience, and and when I think of those times, I I see that it wasn't necessarily as as nice as all these many you know permanences are. So, what a yeah. piece of anti-tropics. What what exactly does the anti-tropics mean in your work, and how do you reference it? the anti-tropics? How they reference? To. Um, well, I mean, I like that term. I never really coined it before, but I, I, I like. Um, I specifically like black, and that's a way of making a, my tropical self and my tropical um, being the the kind of negating this idea. You know, you're in, in the people I'm associating with in, that don't know me very well might be like, oh wow, you're going to Puerto Rico. That's that's great. You're going to be drinking piña coladas and being on you know this beautiful beach, and that's not necessarily true um, because it's my home, it's my family, and coming here to to deal with issues that not you know have nothing to do with with that view of what a tropical or being tropical. Um, so I, I in my work I like been using a lot of black, especially in the paintings and installation work. Um, of this idea of like kind of erasing that, negating it, um, and you know going back to this idea of um, mourning, like seeing nostalgia as a way of mourning. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. There, I do get a lot of mourning from your work. But Anika, did I? Did, I, did you have a question? Yeah, <laughs> I have a question for Alma. But not not necessarily a question, it's more of a, like a comment about this um, nostalgia issue and like trop being tropical. Because in a sense it's like um we are away. I think all of us um here in this talk have experienced this idea of being away from a place that you identify as like a home and um that nostalgia kind of um clicks in, somehow like clouds. In a way, it's like you, 
it's a way to like um claim something for yourself, you know, um and then when you're back it's like suddenly you realize that okay there's more than this nostalgia is this kind of um reality which um Annabelle was talking about was like it has nothing to do with because you're inside now, you know, it's like it has nothing to do with that kind of surface um thing. Um, but I had a question for Mark. Um, to do with nostalgia. Okay. Uh, because I looked at your drawings, and I would imagine that they're very labor-intensive. Um, are they? Yeah, they they definitely have been in spots. Yeah. I would say so. Yeah. I mean, like, do you think that? Because I would imagine that like that's a long process, and in that process, you're thinking about um, this kind of map or mapping that you're doing. Um, do you think that the act of making the drawings is a way of kind of dealing with this nostalgic issue or this idea of trying to understand what this place is that you're living in now? It's a good question. <laughs> I don't know. I, I just had a conversation on nostalgia last night, and I feel like I felt it really heavy when I moved from San Francisco back to Barbados. So I was just, and I think I had read Never Let Me Go right around that time. So I was just on this nostalgia binge. But for me, I don't know if I really feel as nostalgia. It's more about this curiosity latching on to something on a podcast or hearing something in a conversation and leaving and researching that and kind of going down that rabbit hole. For me, that's really been the process. So creating, sketching, that is quite labor intensive. But when I'm doing that, I'm just trying to focus as much as possible. And that means just really sitting there with a pen or pencil and paper and doing it. And once I get into a groove, I'll listen to Radio Lab or other podcasts and just soak up a lot of information that might be related to things that are kind of bouncing around my head so my brain's a little active in that sphere of uh, thought at the time. But there's, um, Mark, it's, there's also, I mean, in this mapping, there's also like a sort of utility to it, isn't there? Because... Um, yes, the drawings look like grids and they look like maps, but um, but they're but they're essentially just repeating patterns of um, they're essentially repeating patterns of of a particular state, right? So um, I just I don't know. I mean, is there anything that you you want to respond to that way? Um, you know, it's it, they're all, it's almost like a re repetition of a meditative state. And um, mm -hmm. that that resemble pack, that resemble maps, but they're I mean they're not they're ultimately ultimately they cannot guide you to anything any any place specifically rather than where you are at that moment. Um, so so it, I, I just want you to respond to that. I mean the thought isn't fully for mm -hmm. um. Um, but not, a, not a problem. Uh, as far as the repetition, and it, I, I build these really. It's not, and I build them in kind of an ass backwards way at times. And <laughs> I, when I'm building, I'm figuring them out and I'm tweaking. And there is a fluidity to it. But with respects to the maps and maps in particular, maps aren't my primary focus. But I do understand that uh, there's this there's this theme that I'm really interested in exploring that I haven't really touched on yet, but, but when you look at modernism and maps in the 20th century and this concept, this maps and map making is just has always been loaded and very colonial. But there's also this idea of legibility and what happens with legibilities because maps don't show everything. Mm -hmm. Traditional maps and maps also distort. Maps aren't sh like, telling the whole picture and they're biased. So I feel that if I'm projecting this uh, map, you can call it, I'm just projecting 
my perspective. Mm -hmm. So it's not it's not sullied. It's not a compromise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wanted to um, go ahead. Um, Who is that? Is that Anika well, or okay. I wanted to ask about um the way, you know the aesthetic of the work. Um it's very clean and crisp and sharp. Um even it's a trace of um this period right, that you're sitting down and absorbing the radio as you talked about. Um, I was wondering if how you navigate this idea of a kind of Caribbean aesthetic um, and this connection to clearly um, your education and a lot of your life has been lived away from the Caribbean. Um, and then there's I see that links to like um, it's very kind of minimalist as you mentioned before conceptual art. Uh, like how are you kind of um, making these things become um, something of a gel in your work, or does that not concern you at all? Do you mind repeating that last part, please? Um, I, yeah, I was asking about how. You know the minimalism and um, the clear reference to um, North America and our Western art, and then um, a lot of the way that a lot of that work looked aesthetic, and this kind of general drive somehow in some parts of the Caribbean to think about a Caribbean aesthetic. I was wondering if these are things that are concerned to um, in your work and how so. Well, you know, for me, that whole moving around outside of the Caribbean and just the way I grew up, obviously, what I was exposed to from a young age was just art from all over the place, art from South America, the Caribbean, Africa, Asia. So I grew up with these pieces with Haitian art, with Jamaican art and uh, Puerto Rican art. Barbadian artists and all that. So when I moved to Europe, of course I was around the Dutch, the French, and the Belgian masters and also the British masters. So when I was a kid, I would go to museums and uh, I remember going to Rembrandt's house. And certain things did stick out along the way. Uh, for example, a trip to David Hockney's museum in the Lake District really left a lasting impression. When I was in D.C., going to a Douglas Gordon show at the Hirshhorn, and of course living in San Francisco. So moving around, like those aesthetics really did uh, influence me, but as far as really having that, uh, or considering a, a Caribbean aesthetic, that hasn't really come up because I feel that there's so many different aesthetics and the Caribbean is just so hybridized there's so many different pockets of uh, flavors, I could call them, going on. And it, I, I hear it, it always comes up, this idea of Car uh, Caribbean <laughs> aesthetic, mm -hmm. but I feel the context it comes up in is more of a kind of pastoral, tourist kind of, kind of view. Mm -hmm. Wanika, I wonder if you could talk a bit about, you know, because the conversation has been going back to this whole idea of migration and and how this sense of otherness informs the work. Um, but you're actually you're actually living back, even though you, it sounds as if you know you are um, based on what I know of your work. Um, it developed a lot. It developed while you were in grad school in. In Japan, in in Kyoto, right? Yes, yes. Uh, but you're back in Jamaica now, and you've been back since last year. Um, yes. And I want to know how has that affected your work? If being, if the whole idea of otherness uh, informed this this current turn in your work, I know you're back in Jamaica. How how has the idea of otherness um, crept in or crept out, stayed in rather, or 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 kind of um, left your work? What else has come in? What kind of changes in general have you seen or do you feel coming on if it hasn't actually manifested? Yeah, um, this idea of otherness, I guess, is one I've been 
thinking about uh, way before um, going to Japan, um, you know, going to or being a part of the whole Edna Manley College system, um, these are big questions that are somehow like a root, you know, in the fine arts. Um, there, uh, so, but you know, while I was in Jamaica before, I was really thinking of images that represented um, people that looked like myself and how that could be alienating. And I was really looking at um, North American and kind of stereotypes. So uh, a lot of the work, you know, looked at um, black stereotypes and then it moved on to looking at um, white stereotypes. Um, but then, you know, that, that comes from a certain understanding of the dialogue that's happening in the Caribbean with the fine arts. And I was really, you know, I was, I was really getting into that and I, you know, sinking my teeth into that. And then being dropped in um, Kyoto, Japan, which is so far away from Kingston, Jamaica. Um, it's, it's just um, it's not even considerable, imaginable. Um, the that whole understanding of what otherness is, is something that I really began to feel um, in a very personal way, and it had nothing to do with the otherness that I was exploring in terms of racial otherness um, in Jamaica as in Jamaica. It had to do with just being completely outside of our culture and having to kind of reorient this kind of identity that you have of, oh, okay, so I'm, I, I thought I was like a Jamaican person, but that has no, um, that has no validity, you know, in, in, in somewhere like Kyoto, Japan. And so you have to kind of really start to, to, to think about, okay, and how, um, how are people perceiving me? Um, and I have to start to, uh, um, to see almost through their eyes. And there's something really interesting that can happen because you can start to tailor the way that you're perceived by tailoring certain things about your behavior. And so that was like a whole kind of awakening process that was happening there. Um, yeah, so that's when I started to photograph myself and to draw these um, self-portraits. Um, to kind of try to understand what people were seeing or what people were thinking. Um, and it's also like a reaffirming so of being, your presence, right? It, it's a reaffirming yeah, a way, of your yeah. presence, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, right. <laughs> it's really interesting that, you know, I was taking that work very seriously there and it was um, this Japanese word, kawaii, which is um, like cute. Mm -hmm. And so even, you know, I was, I was trying to be very serious with this work and it was being perceived in this way. And um, so now being back in Jamaica, um, of course five years have passed, so it's not Jamaica that I knew um, before I left. So there's a gap as well. Um, I'm a completely different person as well. So in a sense, now again, I'm an outsider, so I have to kind of reorient that. Um, and I don't find it appropriate to approach things in the same way, um, or the same voice, um, that, you know, these, a natural history happened in, while in Japan. So at this point, I'm really trying to think about what is happening in this space, and oddly enough, I'm finding that I'm actually, I have this feeling of nostalgia that um, Mark and Annabelle spoke about but I have it for um, the person I was in Japan and how that's kind of um, conflicting. You know, you're, you're back in Jamaica, you should kind of be, especially Jamaican culture is very kind of um, very heavy and you kind of have to um, just, you know, kind of put it back on like clothing and somehow this kind of person I was before, person I am now, it's, it's something I'm trying to think about in terms of um, new narratives, new ways of um, 
It's an art. Do you do you see like um, using different media or like kind of re this new narrative will take on like new new way of reworking it or kind of using the same um, processes that you were um, experimenting and using, um, but just an actual different narrative. Right. Um, yeah. I. It's, 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 it's something that it's it's, it's forming. Um, so I was working with a lot of video before um, and kind of using the basic animation um, to tell some stories before. Um, so now I find myself um, thinking more about kind of memory. Um, I had started a project on Facebook called the selfie drawing project where I just ask people to send in um, uh, photos of themselves and then I would just draw it and then I would give it back to them and then um, I would now take that self portrait and try to think about this person because um, these people that you, you know you know through Facebook a lot of people when I came back to Jamaica, I was meeting them for the first time, um, such as Deborah. Um, I so years went by and then I, I met Deborah and then, so what is it like to um, to think about these people that you knew while you were in Japan and these people that you're meeting now? Um, and somehow this kind of mark making is allowing me to think about it so I can relate to um, what Mark Mark does. You know, he, he sits in a studio and he like allows you know, his influences to flow over him and the the result I suppose is kind of like a trace of what um, was there before. So I'm I'm really interested now in thinking about what are the the little bits of memory that I can um, hold on to. Yeah, I think that's as much as I can say about it now. Well, is it still intuitive, you find? Um, yeah, in a way, I mean, it's, uh, in a sense, it's like you, you think about this idea, you think about how to make it, uh, and then in actual making, you, you kind of have to sit down with this thing and just allow, allow something that's, you know, like in your hand, not in your head, to kind of um, to happen. Um, that's, that's how I feel it works for me. Is it almost like you're deconstructing this, um, these visions of, of like memories by also involving people that, you know, were those virtual connections um, that are now, you know, becoming by meeting them in Jamaica, but also thinking about the people you knew in Japan. Um, so like memories and then also having them be participatory, it's almost very participatory in that sense of this deconstruction and also construction of, of a new narrative. Yeah, yeah, I feel like um, there is a narrative which, which is emerging but I'm not dictating um, how that's going to happen at this point. Um, yeah, and I, I quite enjoy the fact that people are somehow participating in this narrative kind of unknowingly. Um, they, ha you know, a lot of the people have gotten their self-portraits and um, are free to do what they want with it. And um, to know I'm, I'm free to do what I want with their portraits. Um, and so I, I think that's where the narrative kind of comes in. Um, yeah. Can we can we talk a little bit more since you bring that up, Annabelle? about the construction of a new narrative. I'm always interested in the artist's role, um, in the artist's role in doing that. And I wonder if each of you uh, has opinions about that and um, the ability of an artist to, to construct, as you say, new narratives. Did you, did you feel that that was something you were doing with the work in that you did in Kyoto? Mark, do you feel that that's what you're doing in any way with the work that you've done since you've been in Barbados? And and likewise, Annabelle, can you each speak a bit about that? We're coming, actually, we have only 10 minutes left. I can't even believe it. But I'd love yeah. for you each to speak about that. Um, well, I can go first, if that's OK. Yes. Um, well, I think of, of 
kind of new narratives, but then that are you know are being created. But I always love that when when I am creating what I think is new narratives, kind of running into um, bits and pieces of that same narrative and how history repeats itself, um, and in taking those things and inserting them unknowingly, and then also um, rearranging them in a in a way that I hope can create a new narrative that can speak to um, not only people that are in the same situation as I am, but um, people who are have already gone through it or are going to, and, and see how that can inform their own narrative and for, so that we can all be creating simultaneously, um, which I think is happening, especially now as also, seeing all this work from Anika and Mark and all the people that are um, participating in Emerge, um, I see there, there's a common thread of this narrative and being done in very different ways, but all these things that are intersecting. Um, yeah. Cool. Mark? I think Mark? so. Yeah? Hello? Yeah, got you. Yeah. I feel that I'm attempting that, but like Annabelle was saying, you find out like the next day that somebody's been doing it for 30 years, or there's this kind of collective push in that direction. And I think my process allows for me to be just very ignorant of that, because I get so into the process, and the inspiration might come from say, a news article or some new research in uh, like cognitive behavior. And I'll say, OK, let me latch on to that because it relates to what I'm kind of dealing with. And it allows me to kind of push forward. I, I just let my curiosity push the concept forward. And so I am attempting to create a new narrative by uh, kind of latching on to a narrative that's going on in a different field completely. Or, but you also respond. You you also take what's a given in your environment and you respond to it. You literally respond to it in ways that are not necessarily congruous with the with the original content. You know, with the call and response series. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah and that's also me just projecting my my perspective and being in that case kind of subs off work and commenting on. Well, this is a road. These signs are up. You don't have just and to give you some background in Barbados, you don't have a lot of you don't have any street art really around. You don't have many flyers up except for dub posters, and then you have these signs. There isn't even much graffiti that you'll see here, but then you have these signs that are ubiquitous in the island, and I just thought that something needed to be added to them to kind of create a dialogue. So when you're actually walking down the street, they were, of course, promptly taken down. But <laughs> sure, like something needed to be added to this. Jesus yeah. is coming to your team. <laughs> yeah, so there, there's actually a third one that is not included in the show. So you would walk down the street, and the first sign you would see is, Jesus is coming, tuck your chain. And then the second sign you would see is, Jesus is coming, look busy, and the third sign, <laughs> Jesus is coming, wait here. So just mm -hmm. kind of bringing these steps and engaging with people that would just probably wouldn't even look at the signs. Mm -hmm. But those signs themselves, the Jesus is coming signs, they are ubiquitous in, in Barbados? Yeah, all over the island. Oh, wow. yeah. That's and nobody takes them down, or nobody really messes them, but they're, I would assume they're totally illegal if you're just posting signs all over the place. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's really interesting. So that, um, you actually write on the signs? Yes. You actually write on the signs, Mark, and then um, photograph it? Yes, that is correct. Okay. With a giant permanent marker. <laughs> Nika, do you want to weigh in before we, before we say bye-bye? Do you want to weigh in on this whole artist? Yeah creating a new narrative and um, a little bit more because I know it was like a little part of Annabelle's question but I want to know if you felt you were creating a new narrative within 
Kyoto and also um yeah, how do you feel that you, your art could if if you even if you're even interested in creating a new narrative, how it could function in that capacity in Jamaica? Yeah, um I I I'm really interested in like the ways that both Annabelle and Mark have um decided to create a new narrative. Um in Annabelle by I guess this kind of lived experience and then being in another place and kind of allowing things to happen I suppose. Um and Mark by kind of uh observing and then kind of interrupting um which for me, uh, you know, I, I normally approach my work with thinking, okay, on the small scale that this is a narrative. Um, but I guess when you put the art out there, it somehow changes something. You know, for those who look at it um, or engage with the art, it changes something. Or you know, if it's if it's working properly, it should help people in some way to kind of think about what is going on. I think what I was doing in, in Japan um, maybe might have caused some confusion. You know, um, maybe why why is this why is this a big deal for um, this person? Um, might have been some of this sentiment or you know, why is this even you know, this is the way things are, so what is the importance of that? Um, mm -hmm. And then it becomes like, okay, this is a personal narrative that this person has. Whereas I felt like it was um, kind of this cultural narrative that I brought with me. Um, and so I, I guess the way I'm looking at work now is um, in this kind of broader sense of narrative where you're trying to dialogue and kind of interact with what's happening socially and culturally. So, which is why I'm, I'm, I'm appreciating a lot of what is happening in um, Mark and Annabelle's work. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Well, I just want to tell you, all three of you, thank you very much for um, for coming on and um, giving, allowing us the opportunity to have a greater insight into your work. And um, I think just also the dynamic between the three of you um, just brought a lot more out in terms of understanding and um, there's a lot of content there and I can't wait to show your work next week um, at Emerge. Yay! <laughs> Thanks for opportunity. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no problem. De nada. And if for anybody who wants to see their work, it's going to be in room 212 at Emerge next week at the Capital Skyline Hotel. And thank you very much for tuning in, and everyone have a good night.